I got on a flight to Johannesburg to save the world. Three years ago, I was a sophomore at Purdue University when I had an idea. I had developed a brand new type of drone, one that could fly for 10 hours continuously without needing to land and recharge. My idea was to give that drone to every anti-poaching team in Africa, a surveillance camera for rhino and elephant we would be able to catch poachers long before they got anywhere close to the precious animals. And I talked to a lot of experts about this, folks you'd see on Nat Geo, and they were generally positive about the idea, but the one thing I kept hearing was that, you know, Rahul, drones can't solve this problem, not entirely. And I remember thinking, yeah, okay, but you haven't seen my drones. And then I landed in South Africa and reality sunk in. I learned that anti-poaching really has two faces. On the surface is a veneer, a veneer designed to bring in a lot of Western money. You see tough, armed to the teeth, anti-poaching guys who look like they came out of Call of Duty, marching around the reserves, making sure that poachers can't get anywhere near the rhino. But that is just a veneer, just designed to bring in money. Real anti-poachers aren't so much concerned about catching poachers as they are about poverty. You see, the people who do the poaching, the actual poachers themselves, they tend to be the poorest people from the poorest parts of the world. When they commit the poaching, they'll often write in their own blood on the body of the animal, please forgive me. It was an act of desperation. And this raises the question, how did they get close to the rhino in the first place? Aren't there supposed to be these armed guards? Well, it turns out the armed guards aren't really paid all that much. And they do love rhino and elephant, but they love feeding their kids more. Uh, and so bribing them is no difficult task. And then you ask yourself, okay, then why doesn't the reserve owner just pay the anti-poaching people better? It's because the reserve owner has learned that the best way to get international media, attention, press, and most importantly, money, is to have a poaching incident happen within your walls. Drones can't solve this problem. And I remember asking my friend and anti-poaching expert, L.B. Williams, what do we do? Do we need to give more aid, food, water? What's the catch here? And he pointed out the window of his Jeep to a group of kids wearing Toms. Now, Tom's shoes on the surface is a brilliant concept. The idea is you buy a pair of shoes here in the United States and they'll donate one to a child in need. The problem is kids in Africa already have a place to buy shoes. African shoemakers make shoes, but African shoemakers can't compete with free. It's an example of how well-intentioned aid from the West can have unintended consequences in the field. All throughout Africa, aid flows in. Water, food, vaccines, these are really important. People will die without them. But then we get to bicycles, backpacks, shoes, laptops. And suddenly, in a lot of these countries, we aren't just fixing problems, we're creating them by not allowing them to grow. The Western world has gotten wise to this. They've started investing more in something called infrastructure aid. It's development aid that actually helps people grow. And back in the United States, I dropped out of school. I wanted to get in on this infrastructure aid thing. I had some cool drones. And I wasn't gonna learn how to put those two things together in thermodynamics class. After I dropped out, I started a small company and took my drones to conferences around the world, meeting the best and brightest to try to figure this out. And all my roads led back to one place, the internet. Now a poor village with the internet is unrecognizable from its former past. A farmer in that village, through the internet, now has access to everything humanity knows about farming. An entrepreneur in that village isn't just selling her goods to other villagers, she's selling them to rich Americans 
and bringing in more money into her economy than ever before. A young school child who couldn't afford textbooks now has access to Khan Academy and becomes the smartest little girl that village has ever seen. In short, the internet has become the greatest tool for economic and individual liberation the world has ever seen. And 49% of the world does not have it. Nearly half of the world does not have access to their best key out of poverty. What in the world is going wrong? Well, it turns out, like a lot of things in the world, the problem stems from one important thing, cash. Cell phone towers are not cheap, and you need a lot of them to cover an area, to have good enough coverage in a city or town. That makes a lot of sense to build enough cell phone towers to cover a rich city. It might even make sense, financially, to build enough towers to cover a poor city. But building enough cell phone towers to cover a poor suburb? or a poor village? No, it doesn't work. No one is gonna pay to build $10 million cell phone towers in an African village. And that's when I had an idea. What if, instead of 10 cell phone towers, we could get away with just three? The old model was building enough cell phone towers so you could have coverage everywhere all the time. But, Let's say we're working in a religious town. I know that on Sunday morning, those folks are gonna go to church. So I can put up three cell phone towers by the church and cover everybody. Then I know Monday morning, they're gonna go to work or school. So we'll put the cell phone towers near the commerce areas where the uh, schools and work is. And then in the evening, they're gonna go home. So we can put the cell phone towers near the homes. There's one small problem. Cell phone towers are really big and really heavy and like dug into the ground. It's really hard, it's impossible to move a cell phone tower, but not if the cell phone tower can fly. Now what I'm telling you is patently ridiculous. Using a drone as a cell phone tower? I talked to a lot of robotics experts about this and they kindly informed me that the ESCs were going to explode, the motors were going to overheat, the propeller attachment just wasn't going to hold. This isn't possible, and so we did it anyway. I pulled together a team of the smartest people I knew into a garage in uptown Minneapolis, and we got to work. And a month later, after designing this system from the ground up, we thought we had something that might be able to do it. And so we took it to my parents' backyard and tied it down. We knew that if the motors could stay spinning, we didn't even need to fly. If the motors could stay spinning, we would be able to stay in the air. And so we started. We ran the motors. 24 hours passed. The motors are still going. Pretty good news. One week. Two weeks. Three weeks. Four weeks. That's a world record. Five weeks. And after six weeks, 42 days, Minneapolis got hit by a blizzard and we had to shut our test down. But the point is, we had a flying cell phone tower. It worked and we were gonna use it. So what did we do? Naturally, we went to France. Uh, every year in Cuberon, they run the French National Windsurfing Championship. And there are two big problems. The first is the town of Cuberon has a couple of hundred people and barely enough internet access to cover them. When you bring in a thousand or several thousand people for a windsurfing championship, their network just can't handle it. And the second big problem for windsurfing championships is that windsurfing is really, really boring to watch. Because you're standing on the beach and you have little dots out in the bay. And that's, that's the windsurfers, they look like ants. So we were gonna try to solve both these problems. Within a couple of hours of arriving, we were able to put up our flying cell phone towers and cover the entire area with 4G and 5G network coverage. And we had a friend of ours who was also a drone pilot bring his drone along. He put on a 16K, 360 degree VR camera and flew his drone through the windsurfing championship. Suddenly, we could live stream that video to people wearing virtual reality goggles 
on the beach. You didn't have to watch little ants out in the sea. You could fly through the competition. And this was, of course, a huge development and a really cool new way to experience sports. But we were not done. A month later, we had the opportunity to be involved with Operation Convergent Response, a large-scale demonstration of America's first responders and networking abilities post-disaster. The situation we were involved in was a large-scale flood in Perry, Georgia. They actually flooded several city blocks and brought in hundreds of first responders to respond to the crisis. And while they were out in the field, our systems were flying to provide internet access. And we learned a lot of important things while we were there. When a disaster strikes, it takes a few days to a few weeks for the cavalry to roll in. The cellular on wheels systems, the permanent towers. For days and weeks, first responders operate in the dark without internet. And in the first days and weeks is when people are trapped in buildings and under floods. Today, it's a highly manual process to go in from building to building and find them. And unfortunately, you leave a lot of stones unturned. But if you can get internet access the day after a disaster happens, everybody trapped, their cell phone connects to the internet. Suddenly, you know exactly where everybody trapped is. And as a result, a couple of months later, and from this point, a few weeks ago, when Hurricane Laura slammed into the southern United States, one day later, our systems were there, being tested as internet for first responders. Now, the implications of our system for temporary events, for disaster recovery, are massive. But we started this, this idea of using a flying cell phone tower that you could move to help the global south, to help where this entire journey started in Africa. And so, a few weeks ago, we got confirmation that we were going to send our first systems to Kenya as Africa's first drone-based flying cell towers. And I was telling some of my friends about this, uh, including one who was a telecom operator in South Africa, and he told me a story. He told me about the story of how he tried to build a tower on a hill in South Africa, in a village. So he built this tower at his own expense and went back to his office. And a few days later, his phone buzzed. The cell phone tower had been stolen, sold for scraps. And so he went back at his own personal expense to build a new cell phone tower. And this time, for good measure, he put a sign in both English and close up, please don't steal this. He went back home and within a few days, he got another notification. The cell phone tower had been stolen. He went back and lo and behold, the cell phone tower was gone and the sign was gone too. He had had enough. This time, he built a cell phone tower and put 600 volt spikes in the ground, threatening anybody who would touch his precious cell phone tower with the penalty of death. He went home, and a few hours later, he got a phone call from a less than pleased government official who informed him that his spikes idea was not only a safety violation, but a violation of human decency, human rights, and common sense and that he needed to go and take those spikes down before he hurt somebody. So he drove back to the hill. By the time he got there, the tower and the spikes were already gone. This raises an important point. If we deploy, it can't be our cell phone tower. It's got to be theirs. It's the farmer who grows enough crops to feed his people. The entrepreneur who brings in unprecedented amounts of money into her local economy. And it's the student who becomes smarter than anyone that village has ever seen. When we deploy after a disaster, it's the first responders who are actually saving lives, enabled by our technology. And fundamentally, if we deploy at all, it'll have been because of you. You see, Drones can't solve this problem unless people like you pay attention. People, citizens of the richest and most powerful country in the world, of which I am one too. And despite that, it took me a flight to South Africa to learn that some of the world's biggest problems were simply symptoms of poverty. It took me a flight to South Africa to learn 
that we already had a really great solution to help people get out of poverty, the internet. And almost half the world didn't have access. And it took a flight to South Africa to meet the people who inspired me enough to try to do something about it. I hope you'll consider this your flight to South Africa.